We actually got one more thing. <laughs> we got one more thing. Alabas Oracle Bosco. Oh man. Would you like to start us uh, uh, off? Oh my god, my stomach. I oh mean, my god. I, I could. Before Thank you, you so much. Please, where would you like to oh. start? Uh, let me open it first, and then I'll tell you. I should have started with Connor. I'm not prepared, but I'll get prepared. Let's see if you're prepared before Connor. Nope. <laughs> don't make it a competition. I don't like those. All right, I have it up. Okay, I'm gonna read Gregor's hunting notes. Oh, that's way down there, Jesus! I mean, you have, I haven't heard of Hunter's notes in a while, and we never start with it. So I'm, 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 uh, I'm gonna go with it. Also, you'll see why when it, you'll see what it's about. Ah, uh, I already saw one word, and that's all not right. Like good. It. There you go. Yep. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, Gregor's hunting notes by Gregor. <laughs> good dog. What? I said good dog. Uh, the, no. What? Anyway, Gregor's hunting notes. Ahem. Gregor has questioned for the readers this issue. Have fellow Elevastians ever looked to sky and wondered, ever spy various birds or bugs, or occasional dragon thing and think, they have full control of airways? Gregor wants that, and also them to be in stomach. Well, since readers asked, Gregor wishes to share news of opportunity City has trapped hunters for regarding the capture of Griffons. As recent events made clear beautiful City's lack of proper air defenses, Council is put word out asking for able hunters to trap and deliver Griffons. Or Griffons, as creatures are known in Normarian tongue. To be used as mounts to counter eventual wavern or paratin attack. Elevest, his services of famed Griffon Rider Company, formerly hated by hotshot meteor darling Remy Corbeil, in helping establishment of some kind of air force, but like ready stables of actual Griffons to use. This is where Gregor and many other enterprising readers come in. Each wild griffin brought into city will not net cool 300 gold, 400 for younger, more reliable ones, and full 500 griffon eggs. Griffons are also fiercely territorial and keep a keen focus on any that enter its established area, making this hard to reach. Caging sections of hilltops and cliffs Creating prey could be said to be great a challenge as capturing prey, which is why, as insurance, Gregor, also going into hunting, carrying thick slabs of horse meat and mutton to Everbright Mountain, where prides of griffons have been sighted. Why horse meat? Because griffons love this stuff. Many tales tell of cocky bird beasts swooping down as packs and astounding with horse in broad sunlight, even when rider and equipment still laid it on waiting prey. <laughs> A proper tactic Gregor is just desperate to see and combat. And hey, if in melee Griffon is sadly slain, Gregor can at least partake in fillet Griffin. For first time. All right, Mr. Uh, Bosco, you have booked the role. Congratulations. Oh, thank you, man. I appreciate that. Are you serious? Yes. Oh, God, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Remember to vague tweet about it. All right, I'll vague tweet about it right now. I'll be like, hashtag Taka, hashtag blessed, hashtag secret project, hashtag NDA. <laughs> That's awesome. Connor, what would you like to read now? Oh, one sec. While you're choosing, while you're deciding, I'm gonna read off a couple bits and subs here. Uh, okay. Trash Gremlins with 100 bits. Uh, by the first time I donated to a stream with Bosco, he threatened to kick my teeth in for not going to bed, 
And we have this stream. I follow him here per his instructions, and I get met with beams of butthead noises. I'm 100% sure Bosco is a cursed being. In all seriousness, thanks for the laughs and jokes, y'all. Thank you so much, oh, Crash Thank you, Tremble. appreciate it. And Kurosakura93. One whole dang year? Allow me to be corny and thank you all for giving me the confidence to post my dumb ideas for everyone to see and meet so many wonderful people. Here's to many more. 12 months or so of uh, subbing. Thank you so much, Kurosakura, for being here. Here today. Welcome to my shop. Let me cut your mop. Let me shape your crop. Daintily, daintily. Here today. Gone tomorrow. Barber shop. You want to do some uh, some late letters to the Lady of Liberosia? Oh, we'll get to the letters we... of the Lady of Liberosia. I, 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 I got Liberosia. Connor. Connor's got a pick. We usually do that. We usually do that last. Uh, I'll read. There are no strings Skies on Skies of Tricadia. I Sky... fucking damn it. Da, da, da. Last week marked the inaugural flight of a new Nomurian tour vessel, the small Jeffrey. The first in a planned line of re recreational airships, this craft would be heralded by unprecedented journey. The planned flight would have been, would have seen this ship take off along the Nomarian coastline before seven days of flight over the ocean. Four over the Tricadian continent and a final four over sea before taking a week's respite above the coast of Ruba and turning back. Alas, it seems fate had a different voyage in mind for the small Jeffrey. The first nine days of travel for the vessel stuck to schedule, upon which time the ship made a planned stop above the Tricadian capital to restock on supplies. As a safety measure, the small Jeffrey was equipped with six Featherfall lifeboats, as well as a small sloop for restocking the ship's supplies. Enough food and water for 15 guests and 10 crew members. The Three crew members boarded this sloop and traveled to pick up supplies to last the remaining days. A few hours later, the ship and crew returned as planned, and the small Jeffrey proceeded on its voyage. As night arose over the ship and the passengers turned to the, into their rooms, an odd commotion was heard taking place below deck in the sloop's dock. Piercing the fragmented reports together, we can estimate that a small band of werewolves and vampires snuck their way into the sloop during its restocking effort and managed to remain undetected for the following hours. Upon nightfall, all hell broke loose on the small Jeffrey. The small party of monstrosities made their way above deck and began taking out voyagers in a hail of chaos. In the resulting panic of reporting, six of 25 on board, the small Jeffrey managed to make take control of a lifeboat and flee the ship. Since the Grizzly incident, these six have been recovered and are currently being treated to in Nomerian custody. One of the surviving crew was Alfonso Ramirez, the ship's security officer who provided a Nomerian publication. The Abled Acorn with a description of the night's events, as well as a physical description of the four beasts above the ship. The first one was we saw was a massive werewolf. It tore through the deck of the ship and pulled itself up to the floor. It, it looked like it was missing an eye, and it moved one massive bronze arm. As soon as we tried to move, it chased us all down. I was in the middle of everyone when we tried to outrun the beast. While we were running, I saw three pale monsters making their way towards the ship's control room. One of them looked sort of like a halfling. It had orange hair and two massive pigtails jutting from the back of its head. The other, to her right, was just a shambling mass of blue robes. It had one red eye that you could see no matter where you were. Then, the final one just walked in between them. They were all adorned in these gold-white robes. It wasn't looking at any of us, just a head. Just a head. I can't do this anymore. Get out! Get out now! The only other survivor we have information on is Ben Chinfrey, a human man who was badly scarred in the onslaught. A late medical profile lists a broken jawline, extensive scarring, and a cured like and cured lycanthropy, as well as noting that the victim had an exceptionally large chin. There is currently a massive 100,000 gold bounty for the small Jeffrey safe return, as well as a compensation for any suitable info on the ship's location. 
This story is sure to evolve with time. So to make sure to keep up to date with the Oracle as the Oracle continues to report on this story. Awesome, dude. Thank you so much. Yeah, man, that was good. Winter Baby Doll with 100 bits. Talk uh, just a very amazing live stream after following the Vanis MW Friday Night Flashbang. Bosco, you are a very handsome, talented man who could be a little scary, but still a great man. Connor, a very honorable, awesome man with great of the great narration. Lots of love to you guys. Wanted to compliment you all for the night. Thank you so much, Winter Baby Doll, for the 100 bits and the uh, confidence boost. Yeah, thank, uh, we really appreciate that, and thank you for lying to me. I, uh, your check's in the mail. By the gods, look at that mustache. Strong mustache wax. Did someone say a mustache? Okay, I'm, I'm trying to decide between expert, the shape of the world, experts meet and disagree. Or, there are no strings on me. Or, under con underway. Under con underway? Un yes. Under con underway. How about there are no strings on me? There are no strings on me. They got no strings on me! A day at any of the municipal parks here in Alabas can be a real flip of a coin. Some days you're able to catch a lovely sunset with a beautiful lady. Others, you can get mugged by a muscle-bound flock of pigeons. When public events or shows are being put on there, the council enlists guards to help keep order and citizens safe. However, even with these precautions, you need to remember that this is Alabast. What started as a normal show, puppet sh normal show for Hagglepuff's traveling puppet show turned into chaos when a rogue puppet seemingly attacked its puppeteer, leaving him with a bite marks and a fractured shoulder. Many children were injured in the chaos that followed afterwards, as many panicked and made a run for the safety. Uh, the nearby city guard was able to rush in and claim the calm the situation down, killing the puppet Bartleby Bunbun -Bun and organizing order. It, it, it was due to the quick response that the children didn't suffer any serious injuries. A couple of bruises and a scraped knees are the worst it got. The puppeteer is faring a bit worse, but the clerics say that he will make a full recovery in no time. I don't know what caused all this, states Victor H Higglepuff, owner and performer for Higglepuff's Traveling Puppet Show. We've done this act a million times, and I've never seen anything like this happen before. Maybe a puppet would lose an eye, or a button or an arm would fall off at worst. But I've never seen one of them come to life and, and assault its puppeteer. Those poor kids! To see something like that! Well, Mr. Hicklepuff had no idea what happened to his show. The, uh, guards had more detailed explanation of what transpired. According, uh, according to the puppeteer, a uh, man that goes by Hanson Bartleby was, uh, a newer puppet. Mr. Hicklepuff won in a trunk of them in an auction just a few weeks ago. Ended up getting a lot of them. A lot of about ten. Uh, this was the first time it uh, came to life, as it was docile during practices and rehearsals. Upon further ex examination of Bartleby, our experts have determined that this was a rare breed of mimics, known more commonly as mippets. Now, mippets will act like puppets and dolls to lure its victims into a sense of security. Let the guard down, take it home, wait for the best moment. Bartleby here must have sensed the children nearby and thought it was a good time to strike. Hanson is lucky he got it off in time. The poor man could have lost an arm. When asked about the lot of ten that Bartleby Bun Bun came with, the guard gave him a grim face and informed us that, that when they went to inspect the case, it was empty. If you see any abandoned stuffed animals or puppets or spot any waving you into a dark alley that seem like they would have fall the, the, the following names assigned to them, call out for the guards as loud as you can. The names are as follows. Yordle, Piglet Penelope, Mouthless, Krabby Cakes, Rhubarb, Ulysses the Hound, Professor Victor Don Honeysuckle, and Greg. Yo, guys, you hear about that Mippet stuff that's going on? Remy! Remy! Oh, uh, uh, yes? What is wrong with your voice? No, nothing is. What? What are you talking about? I, 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 I'm worried. I think. About what? Panic, come here. Panic, come here. What? What do you, what do you... No, we can't. I, 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 can't, I can either confirm nor deny this, but either Task or Greckles is a Mippet. What the, what is a Mippet? A whole new kind of fucked up. Shouldn't you be the underdog right now? We should. I heard there's a con! 
No, what? No. UnderCon so underway after being canceled last year following the unsavory rumors and attendee scandals, the dubiously named UnderCon has returned to the city of Alabast. As Elf proclaimed, gathering oasis for all those who seek to appreciate the wonders of the Underdark with none of the risk. The tents and booths of UnderCon have once more peppered the skyline of the Druidic District with spheres of artificial darkness to recreate the notoriously treacherous depths that twine beneath the surface. The convention gathered quite a bit of buzz, especially for promising a genuine depictions of underdark flora and fauna, which unfortunately led to a swift cancellation of the convention by the guards last year. We really did a lot better this time around, I think, says G Gilkey Windaloo, who organized the event this year and the last. We were, uh, well, I want to say excited. Is, is excited? Okay, not zealous. Can't legally say that after last year. We, we were excited, you know, to share our love for uh, everything involving the underdark. Miss Windaloo explains... A uh, frequent researcher, she has several articles and journals to her name detailing excursions into the Underdark of other continents. It's really a fascinating place, quite peculiar, very interesting. Would you like one of our souvenir tentacle hats? You're right, no, too soon after what happened last time. Still, I'm really confident about this year. It's not exactly the same, but it's still much safer than uh, going down there this time of year. You'd have to be some sort of lineage to do that. Miss Windaloo assures the article that most of the attractions have been revamped and sanitized following the disasters of last year. There's to be no Grey Render Petting Zoo this year. The Mind Flayer History Hour has been properly vetted against the possibility of being run by a cult this time around. And the attendees have been told that if they wear costumes to the event, they are to make them, quote-unquote, a little less convincing following altercations with the city guard. We've made, an absolute, we made, we've made absolutely certain to adhere to all the city regulations, follow the right forms, and talk to the right folks. And the safety standards, did you know realistic stalactites are banned for being hung in tents? I had no idea. Or is it stalagmites? Hold on, let me check. The convention also saw a great deal of outcry for its after dark events, which were kept secretive and adult oriented. These events are not to see a return this year. We intended those events to be about the nastier bits, if we're being honest. Uh, the blood ocean, the monsters, the rituals, the really scary stuff you don't want kids having nightmares about, you know? But it ended up being... Uh, let's say a lot of the events required um, superior dark vision. And while there wasn't really anything wrong with what we certainly, with what we certainly didn't file the proper paperwork for the event of that um, caliber. And I got us in a, a lot of trouble. Costume contest merchandise and merchants are expected to return in full form. However, there are some concerns about continued on page eight. My God, can we just, can we first of all just look upon the beauty that is the land of Alavast on top of a humpback whale drawn by August Christopher? Wow. <laughs> are you seeing how intricate this is, dude? I'm, I'm seeing it, but I'm not comprehending it. Yeah, I, I just There's like Jesus. Panic, will. panic, Remy. This is science. I, Borky, do you even know any science? What the at fuck all? is a science? Well, it's, it's, you, pa panic, really? Yeah, and then the whale circles the sun. Does it not no, make sense? No, boys. We're know any then of the reason shit, why the sky is blue is because it's an ocean. Borky, Borky, panic. Sit down. I'm going to teach both of you about science. Please. <clears throat> I want to get my favorite chair. One second. Uh, do you have to? <clears throat> that is quite loud, Borky. <clears throat> I'm just going to like scoot this? my favorite chair over here, but it's it's from a different dimension, so it might make a weird noise. Uh, panic, please. No dimensions in the classroom. Thank you. No. Ow. Why? What do you? No. Panic, please. Yeah. I've scooted it. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> this is drawing of a humpback whale is oh my god this is this is someone said this is some Terry Pratchett shit right here boy is it do you uh do we want to do one more and then go over to the lady letters of the lady of Livrosia? totally up to you uh I would love it can one of you guys read the shape of the world expert meets experts meet and disagree because this uh, art alone deserves a read this art I think Connor just, uh, Connor just volunteered. I, I, I don't do it. The world yeah. being carried on the back of a whale that creates the weather by shooting water out of its blowhole was one of the more sensical theories that put forward at the symposium. Ahem. 
A recent meeting at the Nerasmin Collective Center for Earth Sciences grew heated as several different mages and sages disagreed on some of the more finer points of astronomy and the nature of the world itself. At the heart of the argument was exactly what lies beneath the surface of the Earth and the shape of the planet itself. A variety of different theories were put forward, and that's when things got heated. First, Angus Beerbolter argued that there was no bottom to the terrestrial plane. His reasoning was that many dwarven clans have mined excessively deep, and that if there was a bottom, they would definitely have hit it. His theory was shouted down by uh, Tordwald Gunderson, who called Beerbolter's claims laughable as he recounted the tales of his own clan digging far deeper. Eugene Pitts, a relative newcomer to Alabast and formerly a Chelstonia, put forward his own theory that the world was a hollow sphere and that if one of the one tunneled deep enough, they would emerge on the interior lit by an internal sun. This was greeted with a surprising amount of curiosity, though far from accepted outright. Pitt's revolutionary theory would go far to explain certain phenomena, such as the creatures known as dinosaurs, as assembled, as all assembled agreed that if the world were hollow and lit by some kind of undersun, it would be filled with dinosaurs. It just made sense, said one sage in attendance. Valcinian Valmon, a well-regarded scholar of wild magic, was also in attendance. Valmon was gained quite a reputation as he had been studying the unpredictable arcane for nearly a century, and while he has exploded several times, has never been killed by it. Veilmon put forward the theory that the world was a great disc resting on the back of a giant blue whale. While Pitt's theory was regarded with curiosity, Veilmon's was seen as particularly groundbreaking as the gnomish sorcerer went into detail how the whale would swim through the flux of magic, the water expelled from its blowhole would be clouds and rain. The assembled scholars were amazed as Veilmon's well-constructed theory, especially since it explained the deep-sea vents of wild magic and hypothesized that there would be similar vents deeper underground, about 32 miles below sea level. Veilmon's theory was e elegant in its simplicity and explained everything. And claims, exclaimed Betty Graff, a sage from the Almond clergy who was in attendance, I'm looking forward to the publication of these fine. Not everyone was impressed by the beauty of Veilmon's theories. Bagley Osifik, a well-known crackpot even among the Norasman Nor Collective's eccentric membership, was incensed. The world is round, a giant sphere. It's completely solid. It travels around orbiting the sun, another sphere, and rotates on its axis. The other scholars in attendance were against were aghast as Ossific practically foamed at the mouth, expounding physics and gravity as they were universal truths. The quack then went on to criticize Veilmon's explanation of wild magic being the source of the medium in which the whales swam. The reason why the oceans didn't run off the edges and the source of sustenance of the great whale, he found himself quickly shouted down by mages using thaumaturgy to amplify their voices and escorted from the venue by invisible creatures composed of entirely of forks. <laughs> While being unceremoniously ejected, someone set Osifix breaches on fire using neither, neither flint nor tinder. Poppycock, exclaimed Veilmon. If the world was a solid sphere, the Underdark would be uninhabitable due to the heat and air pressure. Not to mention that everyone on the bottom would just fall off. To think that gravitation is some kind of constant rather than a locally defined phenomenon is the height of naivete. It is magic, after all. <laughs> Veilmon was not available for further comment as he suddenly exploded again. His current whereabouts are unknown, but a reading of chicken entrails predicts he is back home in Nomeri. Hello. Oh my god, it's Monty! Monty? Is it gentleman Mama Monty What are you here? doing here instead of in the art stream drawing it the Pokemon? It ended, it ended, so I'm here. Because I wanted to say oh, we've man. been raided by if, Colonel if Cheru. Wait, if, you're, if you were in an, an art stream, why didn't you raid us? Huh? We, we, well, Cheru did. 
Oh, that you were in a different. I thought you were streaming. It was Shara's stream. I was a guest on Shara's stream. Oh, nice. They, I got invited to a Pokemon draw, so I literally uh, ran over Monty. to get there. Hi. There's there's an article called Skies of Tracadia. Yeah, there is. God and we were like, they had, they, they abs I'm like, they were watching Monty stream, the, covering the adventures of of the uh, of the good ship Small Jeffrey. Oh, oh God. <laughs> There's such trolls and I love it. <laughs> and a vampire with two. And a was that was that Monty screeching? <laughs> Monty screeching. Small Jeffrey. <laughs> my name is Jeff. <laughs> my name is Jeff. <laughs> oh my god. God, small small Jeffrey. Can you imagine being a sailor above the small Jeffrey? I know I can. Oh my god. Small Jeffrey got it got pillaged by a uh a vampire with uh orange pigtail. Oh my god. Is she a vampire, Nadine? I don't know. So who do you think Vise will choose? Will he choose Moon Girl or Best Friend? <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Oh no. Yeah. Oh no, Vise. I... Vise, you yeah, I just can I just state real fast? Um, today again was nuts at my job. Uh, I started work at 9:15, and by 12 noon, we had made over ten thousand dollars in the Yo. store, which is not a big store. We are like slightly bigger than a mom and pop shop. Yeah, I, so, yeah, I said your place. Your place is it's, it's fine. The most people we had in the store, I think, was about 20 people, individual people, and then the, the lowest we had, like we had no people at like one point. For like maybe a minute, but we had at least three people in the store the entire time. It was like nonstop. Black, black foot, fair, real fast here. Uh, sorry, go finish your story, Nadine. No, no worries. That's kind of the end. I just like long day, so if, it's, if I sound tired, there's a reason. This is pretty consistent. So. Blackfoot ferret with elite bits, one thousand three hundred thirty-seven bits from Blackfoot ferret. Cherry raid. Thank you so much, Blackfoot ferret. It's great to see. All y'all over here from Cheru's Ray, thank you so much. But hey, guys, I think it's time. Drum roll, time? guys! It's time. Uh, time for the leaders to the ladies. Ladies, Liberosi. Liberosi. Yeah. Monty, that means Monty, you're starting. Oh, I don't have the thing up. I literally just crawled in here like. Quick, a oh, quick you know what's problem. lovely about that is like, through the oh. magic of technology, all I have to do is this, and now you have it. Oh, good job! Wow, at the same time, mm. Kurt, you. Sneaky, sneaky man. Yeah. All right, all right. Uh, uh, okay. I thought. Uh, I don't know which one I want to do. I'm really tired. I'm sorry. Do no, 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 you're doing the ladies with us. The letters yeah, to the lady yeah, of Liverosia. Yeah. Yeah, I'm reading. I'm just. Which one do I want? Do the first one? Okay. Yeah, do the, the first, first one. one. Yeah. Varus Lady, I am a Triton historian who came to the surface to document Alabas from my home city of Cascada. I've been doing this for a year now, and I've gotten help from a very nice dragonborn woman. She has been helping me since one month into my arrival, and we have since become a couple. Sadly, my time in Alabas is limited, as once my job is done, I have to return home to teach the other Tritons about this new city, or who knows how long, especially since my family would almost certainly force me to stay home once I'm done. I am torn. If I don't go, my studies will have been for nothing. And if I do, I leave behind someone I love. I wish I could take her with me, but she wouldn't be able to breathe. And even if she could, she loves her home here in Alabas. Should I stay with her or leave to finish my job? Sincerely, Studia Shark. Dear Studia Shark, I love you. Your predicament is a difficult one. You are torn between loves, love of family, and love of your work. Love of this new person you've gotten to know. I fully understand being pulled in several directions in this way, and it is never comfortable. Only you can determine what is best for you. Some people think that romantic love takes precedence over all else, but it's only part of ourselves. Think of where you are, where you want to be, and alternatives that may work. Could you sustain a relationship over distance and reunite at a later date? Could you deliver your research and have someone else take on the job of teaching it? Spend time with him. Discuss it with your friend. He may have some insight. Very nice. Mm. Woo! 
You want me to do the next one? Yes, please. Sure. All right. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Dear Lady of Liverosia, I am a pyromancer sorcerer studying here in the city. I have a group of friends that make up their own little adventuring party. They have been getting themselves into some dangerous work as of late by taking some high-level monster hunting missions. They are no by means no bad warriors, but the next mission scares me since they are going after a monster none of them know anything about. I've studied this monster and found it's weak to fire, but they won't let me help them. They said I am, since I'm a student, I should stay in the city and study. But their lives are more important than my grades. I don't want to see them get hurt running into a fight unprepared. So what should I do? Should I trust they'll come home safe or try to go with them? I don't know what to do if they didn't come back. Sincerely, Elf with Scales. Dear Elf with Scales, I love you. It's always difficult when you have friends involved in a dangerous pursuit. Whether or not you go with them is really up to your best judgment about how well suited you are to the aspects of their journey. Not just one creature. Many people head off to the land around the city without weather, without weather appropriate clothing or even a small dagger to defend themselves. Something you can do to support your friends is perhaps creating a scroll or a potion to help them along. All right, you want me to knock out the last one, Kurt? Yes, please. Okay. Actually, you know what? I'll read it. You be the lady. Uh, oh, dear. Okay. Dear lady, I have a friend who just got out of a bad relationship. Her partner didn't treat her very well, so this is a net positive. But another friend of ours has been interested in her for a while and has been asking her out and wanting to establish a relationship. I'm a little concerned that he is being a little bit too forward and that this can only end poorly. Do you think that it's right for someone to start dating a person who has just gone through a breakup, especially from a bad relationship? Signed, Concerned Comrade. Dear Concerned Comrade, I love you! The situation you're describing is all too common. Some people assume that if a person is not in a relationship, they are not in an available state. This is not just people from the outside, but from some folks feel like they have to be in a relationship all the time. This is not very healthy. Even though the breakup may be a good thing, her heart still needs time to heal. Often bad relationships involve one person exerting their will over the other and the mistreated partner needs time to find their own place in life without the unwanted direction. That being said, we are all different and there is no universal timetable for how long to wait between relationships. If you can gently suggest a go-slow approach, it could help. Love, after all, is patient. <coughs> what do you Stop a happy, it! A happy, Stop it! A happy, Stop it! A happy nobody with a 14-month resub. Hey, y'all. How's it going? Going well. Dark Vulture 03 with a 23-month resub. woo -hoo -hoo. Almost a year. Thank you so much, Bosco, for jumping in here doing this. You don't forget, guys, to check this out. Can I, uh... Can I what? just say, I know I jumped in here late. I, I miss the art streams a lot just because of my job. Uh, but I just want to say, uh, the artwork this week, I see the artwork every week, by the way. When I'm on my break at work, I always like go through the feed every time. So I am seeing everything. Um, you guys are great. I love it. I'm sorry I, I'm not here all the time. But this week in particular, there was some great... Did you guys see the animated Bob? Yes. Yeah. We were stunned because we were stunned of that. God, there's there was some really good artwork this week. I think my favorite, like, what other one of my favorite was like, and then he looked at me, and I looked at him, and he looked at me, like, just, just, just oh. And I looked great, at, and I looked at him, and I saw her face, and da, 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 da. <laughs> now I'm um, a believer. Um, and I said no. Also, um, I said I, no. I, I don't want to hype, overhype, but I think this week's, like, this coming week's episode is gonna be. Um, 
it's gonna be interesting. I, I say interesting. I think everyone's gonna be insane in chat. So. So yeah, yeah. No, I'm. It's gonna I'm... be. Uh, it's gonna be. Man, I I just hope I don't get yelled at and a whole bunch of other things. But. Hey. Mm -hmm. So, if if you don't want to you you like not to overhype, but you don't want to miss. I think this this coming session. I think it's gonna be fun. I don't plan on missing it. This summer, oh. beat the heat with fresh squeezed juices at the Romantic. Our staff will hand squeeze all the juice out of your. Oh my god. Excuse me, what? Or if you, you prefer something. You can't pause it. Don't stop. A, a, a juice out of your lemon. Or if you prefer something stronger, some can crush a watermelon between their thighs. Juice me. Connor. Oh, is that so? That so that's what Citric works at on the weekends. Hey. Whoa. Hey. What? Hey. What? Hey. What? Where did that? Hey. How have you know? Yeah, he I'm, is, I'm is a, crying. He, I'm just. I'm like Sanji, just crying with envy at Citric right now. <laughs> Dakota down under with a five a month resub. Thank you so much, Dakota. He loves pumpkin juice. <laughs> Eastern Isle number puzzle intelligence check, but we got some credits here for the Alabast Oracle, the Thread Weaver, Red Wing New Fifty Two, Doc Holiday Forty Five, Scafflar, Alcoholic, Jim the Rabbit Cow, August Christopher, Fenrir Lives, Corsica Ninety Three, Cable McDude, Pwai Suit Forty Seven, Crackaton, and Fr. Froggy's mom. Well done. Whoa, whoa, whoa! That is attacking me. <laughs> and again, all, all by the way, the Dean, did you see what August Christopher made? Uh, no, right at, the, I right, right, that. Right, right at the top here of the Alabaster Oracle. Uh, wait, hold up. It's, it's hold a, up. it's, it's a whale. Whale. Is it the sky whale? Look at that whale. Sky whale, right? No, yeah, it's, 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 it's the where our world, it's where our world is. This is a theory. We're on a giant whale. That makes sense. That explains a lot. <laughs> we now have built a device so we can hear what whales are saying. Whale, what are you saying? <laughs> shut, shut the fuck up! That's what I'm saying. Shut up! Penis, 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 pen